a very warm good morning to all of you. So in continuation with the series of lecture which we have under the NAVCAS training program. So today we are fortunate to have Dr. Suniha Goswami with us. So may I request a Monika Avana to please welcome the invitee speaker. So Dr. Goswami, uh, she is an alumni of Nani Agriculture University, Allahabad, and IRI. So she uh, joined the coveted service of ARS in the year 2009. And uh, very uh, aggressively, she is working in the area of heat stress tolerance in wheat. And she got almost more than six or seven externally funded projects and could able to publish more than 50 publications in different area of uh, wheat. Uh, recently, she got one project on pollen millet. And if you see the title of today's talk, uh, that is uh, Rancidity Matrix, Unfolding the Story of Pearl Millet uh, Powder. So now, uh, with this brief note, I request invitee speaker to please give her talk. So thank you, Dr. Ranjan, for such a nice introduction. Uh, as I told about uh, my talk, so my talk is on rancidity matrix unfolding the story of palm millet flour. So before going det in detail about the topic, let me introduce about the palm millets, its nutritional significance and, and the problem associated with. So palm millet, it is a botanical name, its botanical name is Penicetum glucum. It belongs to family Gramini and it originated basically from Western Africa and its deployed number is 14 and uh, uh, in 2017 the per millet genome was sequenced and uh, the best part is India was the major contributor and the, that paper came in Nature Biotechnology and published from ICRISET. So the genome size of per millet is 1.79 GB and it is a cross pollinated crop and uh, mostly cultivated in Africa and Asian countries. So if you see the status of palm millet in India, so India is the, India is the largest producer of palm millet. It covers area of around 9 to 10 million hectare, production 8 to 9.5 million tons, average productivity so 1000 to uh, 1100 kg per hectare, uh, on an average you can say around 1044 kg per hectare. And the major states which are growing palm millets are Rajasthan, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh and Haryana. And uh, the economic grain yield, it varies from 600 to 700 kg per hectare. If you see the soil and the climate which is required for palm millet production. So like other, uh, other crops, this palm millet, the, uh, it, it's, its yield is best under fertile well drained loamy soil and not uh, grown well under waterlogged condition. But this crop can also grow under poor fertile soil if uh, there is low organic matter contents. Although the yield will be affected, but still farmer will not be in loss. Then the best part is it is the crop which can tolerate adverse uh, climatic condition also like it can grow even under drought stress condition, under high temperature, as you all know, global warming today, it is the major challenge for us. And this is the crop which can promise you to give yield. It will not fail under even high temperature also. So that is the best part with this crop. And uh, the optimum rainfall required, it is 600 to 800 millimeter, but minimum it can, uh, if the rainfall is uh, up to 350 mm, still the crop can survive and give you the yield. So, as I told, it can grow under extreme condition, extreme environmental and climatic conditions. Like it can survive, survive under low fertile soil, at high soil pH, high soil aluminum saturation, low soil moisture, high temperature, high salinity, and limited rainfall. Like here, you can see here uh, graph shows that these crops require how much water. So palm, uh, after pulses, this is the palm, palm millet which requires minimum water, around 300, 350 mm rainfall, it is enough for palm millet production. So as I told, now we are facing lot of adverse climatic changes 
like global warming, drought, sometimes flood. So, under such uh, adverse condition as I told, this crop is a promising crop where other crops like wheat, maize or rice, it fails as the global temperature, it is expected that by 2040, 2 degree rise in global temperature. So, this temperature, global temperature is uh, not favorable for the rice or wheat or maize, but this crop can give you promise to give a better yield. So, we can say that per millet is a grain for the future. It can provide nutritional as well as food security to the burgeoning population. So, one side I told about its, uh, its uh, potential about how it can tolerate the adverse environmental condi condition. So, it is not only that it is uh, tolerant to adverse environmental condition, it has the best part is it has a very high nutrient density. If you see the nutritional status of palm millet, so about carbohydrates, so if we compare the carbohydrate content of palm millet with respect to wheat, barley, maize, rice or sorghum which are the generally used cereal, so it is on par, it is not less in that. If you see the protein, so protein is also on par, it is comparable with wheat and rice. But if you see the quality, so quality of palm millet protein, it is much better than the wheat or rice protein, it is best part. Then fat, so it is rich in fat. If you see, so it has the highest content of fat, like it varies from 5 to 7 percent fat per millet, it is high in fat content, it is high lipid content. Then it is rich in dietary fiber, micronutrients, most of the micronutrients like calcium, phosphorus, iron, magnesium, potassium, zinc, sodium, copper, magnesium, all these micronutrients it is there. And among all these, the two mi essential micronutrients, deficiency of which leads to malnutrition that is iron and zinc. So, nowadays most of the per millets they are biofortified with iron and zinc. So, they are rich in iron and zinc and it can uh, fulfill what is what the RDA uh, uh, daily requirement of the iron and zinc, it can fulfill that requirement by consuming in even 100 gram of your per millet. Then it is rich in vitamins like vitamin A, B1, folic acid, in all these and if you see the amino acids, so it is rich in essential amino acids like lysine, threonine, methionine, cysteine, tryptophan. So, if you see the nutritional status, so it is excellent, you can see. Not only these things, the permalate it has, uh, it is as I told about its lipids, it has 5 to 7 percent lipids, but if you see the quality of lipid, again it is excellent. It is rich with omega 3 fatty acid. Nowadays, whatever uh, refined oil available in the market, you see there is label that, that oil is fortified with omega 3. This crop, it is full of with omega 3 fatty acid. As I told, in palm millet, around 5 to 7 percent lipid is there. And 74 percent of that fat content, it is full of with these omega 3 fatty acids like linoleic acid, linoleic acid and oleic acid. So, you can say the Lipid, the lipid of that palm millet is again of excellent quality. Then it, uh, you see, uh, in case of wheat, there is, when you uh, need the, need the uh, wheat flour, so its dough have means of sticky quality, okay. But here, the palm millet, there is no such stickiness. That is because of the, because it is gluten free. So, the person who have uh, wheat allergy like in celiac disease. So, for that also this palm millet is excellent crop because it is gluten free, okay. Then nowadays the food demand is with means everybody is moving towards the low GI, low glycemic index food. Having high resistant starch have high soluble, uh, slowly digestible starch. So, the palm millet is again here wonder because it has mid to low GI less than 55, it has high percent of HDS that is slowly digestible starch and resistant starch. So, nutritionally you can see it is, it is a wonder crop. It can protect us from the uh, malnutrition, it can provide a nutritional security as well as food security. So, like uh, one uh, experiment was done, uh, you can say a study where uh, a group of uh, targeted population which were anemic were targeted 
and they were fed with the pomelet for around 3 months and after 3 months then there was estimation that and it was found that there was improvement in iron and zinc status of that population. So, if you see uh, in uh, anemia, so 50 percent anemia is because of iron deficiency and again there is zinc deficiency disorders are there. So, in that situation permillate can play a major role. It can cure from malnutrition, anemia and provide security and cure for from the hidden hunger. Hidden hunger is because of the uh, deficiency of these mi micronutrients iron and zinc and it is rich in that. So, it can cure from that hidden hunger. So, you can see how nutritionally how important this crop is. So, one side it is climate resilient, second, second thing it is highly nutrient density, its nutrient density is very high, it is excellent in nutrition quality. So, to this we conclude like that this palm millet is good for the planet, how? Huh? Because it grow with limited water supply, with limited uh, supply of minerals, pesticides, fertilizers, all things required is very limited. If you not apply still the crop can survive and give you the yield. Then it, uh, it is a fast growing around 3 months crop. So, it is fast growing crop, so it put less stress to the environment. So, it is good for the environment or the planet. Now, it is good for the farmer. How farmer? So, it is a climate resilient crop, it can survive under even adverse condition and it has multiple use like it can be used as feed, food, fodder in beverage industry as a biofuel. So, it used in it is used or in several way. So, it is um, good for the farmer also and for the consumption point of view. So, as I told it is highly nutritious that is why in 2018 government of India given it a tag of nutri cereal. 10 millets were uh, given the tag of nutri cereal and per millet is one of them. As I told it is rich in all the micronutrients have low GI, gluten free, rich in carbohydrate uh, sorry truth fibers, antioxidants have quality protein, quality fat all these things. So, it is good for consumption point of view also. So, it is excellent in all these things, but besides all these high nutrient uh, potential and uh, climate re resilient behavior still per millet is not that much popular, it is neglected crop. If you uh, if I ask from you then how many of you are consuming per millet in your diet? Among this uh, only uh, 3, 4, 5, 6 peoples only ok, means you can estimate the importance of means how neglected it is. So, why? What is the problem? Why this crop is that much neglected? So, the one problem which uh, if you see the issues which make it to be neglected. So, there are number of issues like first thing it is considered as the inferior or coarse grain or you can say it is called, uh, called as the poor man crop ok. Second thing uh, it has some anti nutritional factors like phytic acid and polyphenol pigments are there. Uh, it has C glycosyl flavone. C glycosyl flavone, there are reports that in a small quantity it, it acts as an antioxidant. But if you take in higher quantity, quantity, so it acts like a goitrogen. Although there is no report that the population which uh, depends on palm millet and they are consuming regularly palm millet, they, there is any case of goiter but it still it is a hypothesis that uh, this compound is goitrogenic. So, uh, so due to un, uh, unawareness about the importance of this crop, this crop people are not accepted. And second thing it, it is rich in PUFA polyunsaturated fatty acid I, uh, as I told rich in omega 3 fatty acid. So, presence of high amount of PUFA it make it susceptible for rancidity, it easily get oxidized that leads to rancidity. And, uh, lack of awareness of nutritional and therapeutical potential of this crop. These are some issues which make this crop neglected and its nuclear uh, nutrient uh, uh, potential is overshaded. So, the point for discussion is here, is rancidity an important trait which overshadowing nutritional facts? Because if you see the population which 
depends on permeate, they are uh, making flour of permeate only for 3 to 4 days, not more than that. And uh, after every 3 or 4 days, they again mill the flour, grain and make the flour. The reason is the permeate flour cannot be stored for more than 7 or 10 days. It gets rancid. That is the major, one of the major problem which is associated with permeate flour consumption. We have to prepare flour every two to, after every 2 to 3 days because we cannot store it more than 7 or 10 days. That is the major issue related with this permeate. So, we can, um, next slide we can see how it overshaded the nutritional impact of this crop. So, before going in detail, first one should know about what is the mechanism, what biochemical reactions takes place which make this flour rancid. Okay. So, this is the permeate grain. Okay. So, its outer layer or uh, it is called aileron layer. This aileron layer has enzyme lipase. Okay. And in the germ of that grain, there is lipid. So, when grain is intact, you can store grain for a year. It will not get rancid. But once you make the flour, within a week or 10 days get rancid. Why? So, the reason is this enzyme lipase is responsible for the lipid hydrolysis. It will convert lipids into free fatty acids. But when it is in grain, so they are in two different compartment. Means lipid is in the germ and lipase is in the outer layer. So, they are in two different compartment. But once you mill it and make the flour, so that lipid is easily accessible to the lipase enzyme. And that lipase uh, start converting this lipid into free fatty acid, that is lipid hydrolysis takes place. So, free fatty acid form. Again, free fatty acid, it is good for health, no doubt because this, the free fatty acid present here that, that are omega 3 fatty acids, so they are good for health. But what happened next is that free fatty acid further oxidized into hydroperoxide by the enzyme lipooxygenase, that is LOX. This lipooxygenase convert free fatty acid into hydroperoxides of free fatty acids. And further peroxidase that is pox enzyme convert that uh, hydroperoxides into aldehydes and ketone. And this aldehyde and ketone, it provide mossy odor or bitterness in the taste. And that is why the flour get rancid. So, this is the mechanism through which the flour get rancid within a week. There is another enzyme that is poly, polyphenol oxidase. This polyphenol oxidase, it acts on polyphenol as I told this crop have also polyphenol content, high in polyphenol content. So, it will convert polyphenol into quinone compound. So, this polyphenol oxidase acts like uh, in fruits, if you cut like apple, if you cut it and uh, keep it for some time, so, uh, so its color becomes brownish. Same thing happened here. While it store is, the color also change of the permeate flow. So, it not looks good. So, it also delimits its acceptance. So, to measure the rancidity status in the floor, how much it get rancid. So, in our lab, we have developed two different tests that is comprehensive acid value and comprehensive peroxide value, which target two different path, pathway of uh, rancidity that is enzymatic rancidity and oxidative rancidity. So, uh, these two tests will measure the status of this uh, rancidity status of the floor. So, comprehensive acid value, it is actually the acid value which is rep uh, reported by AOC and estimated in lipids or oil. Okay? But here we called it as comprehensive acid value because in floor besides lipid there are some other components like phenols, the polyphenols are also there and they may also contribute in that acid acidity test. So, Instead of acid value, here we give the term it as comprehensive acid value. And same way for peroxide value, we have given here the term comprehensive peroxide value. So, this is the reaction what happened where. So, in comprehensive acid value, this is our lipid, lipase convert it into free fatty acids. So, in acid value test, basically we titrate it with NaOH and total volume of NaOH is estimated. Now, it has phenolic compounds, polyphenols are also there. So, polyphenol oxidase convert it into phenoxide ions and this phenoxide ion also give reaction with NOH and form sodium phenoxide. So,
so the hypothesis is this CAV is the tighter volume of both fatty acids and the uh, phenoxide ions also. That is why we coined it, uh, give it the term comprehensive acid value. Okay. Then come to the uh, this free fatty acid further by lipoxygenase activity converted into fatty acid hydroperoxides. And in C, uh, CAV te CPV test means peroxide value test, what we do? We titrate it with sodium thiosulfate. Okay. So, here so tighter volume of sodium thiosulfate is estimated. Now, here polyphenols are also there. So, these polyphenols they form uh, by PPO activity they form quinone oxidation intermediates which further when react with sodium thiosulfate it give hydroquinone thiosulfate means tighter volume is combi combination of this and this is fat, no, fatty acid as well as phenolic compound. That is why we give it, give it the term comprehensive peroxide value. So, lipase is responsible for fatty acid formation and CAV it measures the free fatty acid content, it is the process. So, our hypothesis is that this lipase activity and CAV they are correlated with each other. To test this, we did lipase activity and comprehensive acid value in 93 different genotypes of uh, palm millet in fresh floor and 10 days stored floor. Fresh floor where there is no rancidity and 10 days stored floor which is highly rancid. Okay. So, we found in both the case we found that this lipase activity and CAV they are positively correlated with each other. Then we did lipoxygenase activity and comprehensive peroxide value because lip, uh, as a result of lipoxygenase activity hydroperoxides are formed and CPV it measures the hydroperoxides. So, we uh, estimate is lipoxygenase activity as well as comprehensive peroxide value in same 93 diverse genotypes of palm millets and we found there is with little bit anomalies there is almost positive correlation between the lipoxygenase activity and comprehensive peroxide value. So, based on that we have developed a model for uh, based on 10th day CPV and CAV. Okay. So, the key features which are responsible for uh, rancidity in palm millet flour that are lipids and polyphenols okay. and the key parameters which leads to rancidity pathway that are hydrolysis and oxidation of lipids and polyphenols and the enzymes responsible for that are lipase, lipoxygenase, peroxidase and polyphenol oxidase. Okay. So, we estimated all these parameters and of course, the 10th day CAV and CPV. So, we found that in some there, there are possibility that it varies from uh, variety to variety that in some case lipase activity was very high and lipoxygenase activity was low. In some case we found that li lipase activity was low and lipoxygenase activity was high and in another case they are comparable means LOX and lipase activity was comparable. So, based on that we got different combinations of uh, uh, CAV and CPV like in some case CAV is directly proportional to CPV means both belong to same group. In some case CAV was lower than CPV. CAV is lower than CPV means lipase activity is low, LOX activity is high and in some case CAV is high, CPV is low means CAV is high, lipase activity is high and CPV is low means LOX activity is low. So, all different kind of combinations we found and we when we compare it in our genotypes 93 diverse genotypes in both fresh floor and 10 days stored floor. So, we found all type of combinations where they shows direct proportional CAV is directly proportional to CPV, C, CPV is more than CAV and CP is, CPV is less than CAV all type of combinations we found. So, based on that we have developed a matrix which is based on 10th day CPV because we did some pilot experiment also from day 1 to 10th day uh, means more than up to 30 days actually we did and we found that up to 10th day that CPV was increasing continuously and after that it goes down means 10th day is the critical time where CPV is the maximum. 
means floor get completely rancid. So that is why we target this tent this CPV as our criteria for developing this rancidity matrix. And we fixed one range like the 10th day CPV up to 60, we have called it as low rancid group, low rancid category. Up to 90, 60 to 90, so it, it is medium rancid category and more than 90, so it is highly rancid category. And further, these uh, low, medium and high rancid categories divided into group 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Okay. So, among this group 1, this is least rancid, at 10th day even they were, their CPV was very less between 90 to 30 only, 9 to 30 only, so very less rancid. And accordingly, as the, this we go uh, in the, um, means in group 2, group 3, 4, 5, 6, so rancidity status increases, means they become highly rancid. And further we divide over all the 93 genotypes in this matrix and we found that only 6.45 percent genotype group belongs to group 1, 12.9 in group 2, 4.3 percent genotypes were in group 3, 27.93 were in group 4, 39.79 percent were in group 5 and 8.6 percent genotypes were in group 6. This way all this uh, classified. So, from this we can state that we can give this statement this yes density is the problem which limits the use of permulate and overshade the nutritional fact of permulate. Now the second point is what is the best approach first what are the approach and what is the best approach to redeem this problem. Okay. So, there are number of uh, uh, approaches uh, one can uh, go for like uh, there is post harvest processing, genetic engineering, breeding and hybrid development. So, one by one we will cover one. So, the post harvest. So, sin since 1984 till date number of post harvest processing techniques were uh, going on, but still there is not that much limited, uh, that much success was observed. But still what uh, post harvest uh, processing uh, were done like roasting, decortication, phytates, soaking and germination, boiling, over oven heating, storage in cotton and polythene bags, then use of antioxidants, defatting of the floor, then uh, hot water blanching, germination and malting, acid treatment, toasting, boiling, uh, then followed by refrigeration and microwave treatment. So, all these kind of uh, post harvest processing was given to either grain or to the floor to improve the shelf life of permulate floor. But uh, like uh, uh, in one experiment they keep it in the cotton bag and one in, in one case they keep the floor in the po polythene bag. So, in cotton bag flo floor easily it absorbs the moisture from outside. So, it easily get rancid. But the floor which is kept in the polythene bag, so it uh, here moisture is not available. So, little bit improvement it in its shelf life. Then, then in microwave treatment, uh, uh, they try to inactivate the enzymes by microwave heat, heat treatment. And uh, uh, in 2011, Yada et al, they have reported that uh, uh, they did uh, experiment, they exposed the floor with 0 to 10 seconds microwave exposure and the moisture level of grain, they given the microwave exposure to the grain and then they milled the floor. So, uh, the moisture level was 20 to 24 and they found that uh, at 18 percent, when the moisture level is 18 percent and uh, microwave treatment for 80 seconds, when they have given, they found that lipase activity and polyphenol oxidase activity was reduced at significant level. So, then they checked the overall acceptability of that uh, floor, so up to 30 days. Okay? So, they found that 18 percent moisture and 80 second microwave treatment to the grain and then making the floor improve the uh, floor keeping quality up to 30 days as compared to the non-treated one. So, uh, so all these, uh, these post harvest processing uh, uh, was uh, improving the permulate shelf life, but with the limited means up to maximum one month, not more than that. So, uh, still it is a problem. Then come to the genetic engineering. So, in case of permulate, genetic engineering is not feasible, not acceptable because of the transgenic issue, because already permulate is a neglected crop. 
we are not accepting transgenics in wheat or rice which are most consumed crops. So, permaculture is already a neglected crop, who will accept it? So, that is why perm, uh, genetic engineering in case of permaculture is not recommended. Then breeding and hybrid development, which is most popular because in permaculture most of the hybrids and composite varieties are known. So, um, uh, most of the permalates they are biofortified with iron and zinc which are available now. So, all these are developed by breeding and hybrid programs. Okay. So, in breeding selection of parent is a most important trait. Okay. So, for breeding we have to select a parent which is low rancid and high nutrient density. Then only it is possible that the genotypes which is developed from such parent have better nutritional uh, density as well as low rancid. So, for that there should be a criteria to first check the rancidity status of perm millet fruit. Earlier there was no such matrix which claimed that this is the low or this is the high rancid. So, the breeder randomly selected the parent and go with the hybrid development. But this matrix can help the breeder to select the genotypes which is low rancid and there is possibility the genotypes which develop from low rancid and high nutrient density. So, there is possibility that uh, the, that variety may have higher shelf life and low, uh, low density status. This is the uh, this is a possibility like in Dhan, Shak Dhan Shakti which is a very popular uh, uh, perm millet hybrid which is released from Ikris at Hyderabad. Okay. So, this uh, uh, Dhan Shakti it, it has the iron content is around 80 ppm and zinc is around uh, 35 ppm. Okay. Means, nutritionally it is very good it is biofortified with iron and zinc, but if you see the rancidity status. So, it belongs to at the border of medium and high rancid means it is approximate it is high rancid because people do not know about the rancidity status at that time. But now it is clear that it is a high rancid variety. So, we have to first sell, uh, before selecting any parent we have to check the rancidity status of any uh, all the parents land and select the uh, line parent which is low rancid and also check its nutritional status and select that parent which is low rancid and high nutrient density and that if that can be used for further for the breeding and hybrid development pro uh, program then there is possibility that that uh, that uh, permalate variety have low rancidity with high nutritional density. So, with this all uh, I acknowledge director IRI. Joint Director Research IRI, uh, Dr. Shelly Praveen, Head Division of Biochemistry, Dr. C. Tara Sativati, Project Director, ACRIP on Perm Millet, then Dr. S. P. Singh, Principal Scientist in Division of Genetics, Dr. Ranjit Ranjan Kumar, Senior Scientist in Division of Biochemistry, all my RA, SRF, and students, and special thanks to the funding agency ICR Nisheria of Excellence Program. Thank you for your kind attention. So, now presentation is open for discussion. If you have any queries, you are most welcome. Yes, any one of you. Yeah, please. Come. Good morning, ma'am. It is very fruitful session for me. Myself, Dhruv Inwadi mm -hmm. from Anand Agriculture University. Ma'am, my question is that uh, what is the issues related with transgenic? Transgenic, of course. Transgenic already means uh, to, to release a transgenic variety uh, uh, for consumption, it is itself a big issue. Like a transgenic to come in as a variety, it takes around 10 to 15 years or 20 years because nobody is going to accept the transgenic although there may be a myth or whatever the reason, but people are not easily accepting. Suppose if I am giving you some uh, food commodity and I told that it is transgenic, will you able to take it directly or you, you have a thought whether I should take or not because it is transgenic. So, people are afraid with the transgenic. And second thing, there are lot of uh, uh, rules which are uh, which one have to qualify for releasing any transgenic variety. And uh, perm millet, as I told, it is already a neglected crop. So, 
hybrid uh, through hybrid still we are easily develop uh, new variety in short time and people easily accept it but transgenic crops it is still uh, means there is a question nobody is accepting it that is the major issue okay. thank you madam thank you durbin please Good morning. Good morning. Ma'am, you point out the uh, rancidity problem in the pearl millet. Ma'am, uh, we have earlier lecture and sir explained about the fortification. We mix two uh, different um, millets or two, two different grain floors and we bio uh, fortified that uh, the major, th the outcome floor. So uh, is there any kind of grain or something that we can mix with the pearl millet floor? Because the rancidity, I guess, is it's because of the high moisture content in, in seeds. In fertile, then I will explain. Oh, okay. So if we mix uh, some other seed uh, plant in with pearl millet floor, which uh, maybe decrease that moisture content or decrease the rancidity and uh, bio-fortified it, uh, uh, fortified it, sorry. So is there any, I mean, other plant which we can mix it? Uh, good question. Uh, Actually, in palm millet, rancidity is not because of the moisture. It is a internal inherent enzyme system which is responsible for rancidity development palm millet flour. Like as I told, there are four enzymes: lipase, lipoxygenase, peroxidase, and polyphenol oxidase. So these four enzymes they are the major player of developing rancidity in the flour, and that is the reason why palm millet is not used in any multigrain atta. Because that multigrain atta will become rancid because of the palm millet. Because that atta we are storing for a month or three months like that, or in market and then up to consumer level, it may be up to six months. So palm millet cannot, uh, it, its keeping quality is not that much and it may rancid the floor. That is why it is not used in any multigrain atta. So, thank you. Thank you. So now I think you all will agree that this was a nutri talk loaded with a lot of healthy information. And Paul Millet, you will be surprised to know that even now government, they are put giving a lot of thrust on this particular area. Uh, so 2018 was celebrated at National Year of Millets. And now uh, 2023 has been acclaimed as International Year of Millets. And a lot of projects has been funded in this particular area. And this is one of the good area to work with. And though I am working in the area of cereals, but then now this is a time where uh, we really have to give a thought to replace cereals with millet. Though it is difficult, but then. So with this brief note, now I request uh, uh, our guest, Dr. Dinesh Kumar sir, to please felicitate Dr. Goswami with a memento, a token of love.